We're going to the book of 2 Peter here tonight. Um, my hopes some time back was to do a systematic study of some type of the inspired writings of the Apostle Peter. And uh, in reality, we're going to be doing this in segments. Some of you may recall a few weeks or months ago, I preached about all Scripture that came from 2 Peter chapter number 1. Tonight, we are going to talk about the earlier part of that chapter 1 of 2 Peter. And soon on Sundays, Lord willing, I'm going to be covering some more Scripture uh, from the writings of Peter. So we're going to kind of do it in segments, and I'm just trying to glue this together for you. Uh, when you look at the book of 2 Peter, probably a reasonable date for the writing of 2 Peter was around A.D. 64, 65, somewhere in there. The apostle Peter was imprisoned um, in Rome by the emperor Nero, and he actually realized that he was soon to be executed. And I'm, I'm setting this so that when you hear the writings, you'll know where Peter was at this time. Uh, in fact, according to reliable early tradition, it says that Peter was murdered about A.D. 65 during the persecution of Nero of the Christians there in Rome. In fact, when he's writing this letter, you can look there if you have your Bibles open to 2 Peter chapter 1, his theme, his purpose, he says, I want to be careful, verse 15, to ensure that you always have a reminder of the things after my decrease. So you can imagine as he's anticipating his approaching death, he wants his people to have a reminder of the authenticity of the gospel. And he does in chapter 2 of this book, just three short chapters, in chapter 2 he gives a warning of the danger that's uh, occasioned here by false teachers. And finally in chapter 3 he talks about how the arrival of the last days there's going to be people that scoff and mock about the idea of the second coming of Jesus. With that brief overview and understanding of 2 Peter, I'd like for us to look at one verse here at the outset, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to read verse 10, and then we're going to unpack these verses. Uh, most will be on the screen, but not all. That's why I encourage you to get your Bibles out, and, and let's have a little study together. Amen? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, be eager to make your calling and election sure. Imagine, this man knows he's about to die, and everything that he's invested into this apostolic movement, he's writing, and he said, be more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. If you do these things, you will never fall. And from that verse, I want to talk to you about a no-fail recipe. Everybody say a no-fail recipe. When you use that phrase, a no-fail recipe, uh, it's likely a description of cooking or baking, and it's offered to give the individual confidence, whoever is cooking, that if you will follow these directions, you won't have to worry about failing. It is a no-fail recipe. You're going to enjoy the outcome of that dish. Now, I know some people that says, it doesn't matter, I'll still mess it up. All right? But let me tell you, when the Word of God tells me that I will not fail, I'm all in and I'm all ears. And the inspired writer, the Apostle Peter said, for if you do these things, you will never stumble or you will never fall. Many years ago, I can recall uh, trying to bake a pound cake that ended up being just broken pieces, <laughs> a failure. But when I went back and I saw what I missed in the ingredients and the instructions, it explained the failure. So I want it to be clear, as clear as Peter is, that he says, if you do these things. Now, notwithstanding, the doing is from a place of faith and obedience, realizing it's God that gives the increase. 
Yet if I will do what I can do, God will do what only He can do. I want to make it. I didn't, I didn't start this race to drop out. I want to finish this race. And Peter is giving the recipe of Christian, effective Christian living when he gives us in verses 3 and 4 God's ingredients and then verses 5 through 9 it's our ingredients. Kind of think about it, uh, if you've seen it this way, a just add type thing, like a food kit. Just add this. Just add water. Well, he's given us a recipe that if you will follow God's ingredients and your ingredients, God's ingredients is power and promises. We're going to talk about this in verses 3 and 4. And our ingredients is faith, believing, and acting, verses 5 through 9. Ingredients do not replace each other. They're mixed together. It's not one on top of the other, but rather simultaneously working together. And so tonight we want to talk about since God has given us all the necessary provisions, His ingredients for spiritual maturity, we are to incorporate those godly qualities, our ingredients of faith and obedience. So let's dig into it. Let's look at verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So Peter is writing to the church, like precious faith, those that have been saved. And he said to them in verse 2, grace and peace multiplied to you in the knowledge of of God and of our of Jesus our Lord. Now we understand grace is unmerited favor, but it's more than that. It is a power, it's a force. It is something that it's a strength that enables us people of faith to do what pleases Jesus. How many want to please Jesus? Amen. You guys look like a stadium wave when you went up. That's awesome. But you know you can't do that on your own. But his grace, he said, and peace is multiplied to you. We've got to grow in that grace. And there's a lot of people that want God's grace and peace, but they're unwilling to put the effort to get to know him better in the knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. There's got to be some Bible study. There's got to be some prayer. You've got to actually be listening to me tonight with ears where you can learn. Then he says in verse 3, and this is God's ingredients. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers or participators of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now let's go back there in verse 3 and look at this divine power. The power to grow doesn't come from within us. As I've already stated, it comes from God. And because we don't have the resources to be truly godly, you know what God does? He allows you to participate in His divine nature in order to keep us from sin and help us to live for Him. See that in verse 4? That we could escape the corruption that's in this world through lust. We can't do that without His divine power. Participate literally means to become partners. We're in harness with. We're in yoke with Jesus Christ. Of course, when you're born again... God, by His Spirit, empowers us with His righteousness and His moral goodness. I want you to go to the left for just a minute in the First Peter chapter number 1 because I want you to see what he's talking about when he talks about those promises. Those promises in this context isn't, oh, God promised me that, uh, that He's going to give me that new job. Well, if he promised it to you, you're going to get it. But what he's talking about here is salvation. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, has begotten us again 
to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We've got to learn this new birth is taught throughout the New Testament. It's not just in concise verses that we use frequently. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says in the New Living Translation, by His great mercy, we've been born again. Why? Because God has raised up Jesus from the dead. When Jesus, that's the gospel, when he died and was buried and rose again, when we believed in faith, we were born again of the water and the spirit, and we have a living hope. Now, I don't have time to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. You can scan through it. It talks about a salvation, if I believe it's verse 12, that angels desire to look into. But look at verse number 23. He said, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but in incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever, and this was the word by the gospel that was preached to you. When you hear the good news, the gospel, that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, and you put your faith in that, there is a seed of the Word of God that's planted in you, and that seed causes conception, and it produces a birth. How many have been born again of the water and spirit? That's what he's talking about here. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. There's no chapter divisions in the letter. He said, therefore, since you've been born again, Lay aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. And as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may what? Praise God. I'm glad you raised your hand if you did saying you were born again. But Peter said with that incorruptible seed that was put in you, it ought to produce some things in your life. It ought to cause you to grow and you ought not to give yourself to malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. And that's true in person. That's true on Facebook. That's true everywhere. That if we're born again, we do not give ourselves to evil speaking. And if you go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 and 4, Peter is challenging believers to take full advantage of the divine power and the promise of God that helps us to participate in his divine nature and overcome corruption. You say, Pastor, I deal with lust. I'm fighting lust. I'm going to ask you something. Are you born again? If you're born again, you need to partner with the divine nature and let it produce in you overcoming power. And based on that promised power, Peter, beginning in verse 5, challenges Christians to practice the characteristics of the divine nature so that you can experience eternal rewards. So let's look at it in verse 5. He says, for this very reason, he's referring back to the divine nature. When he begins this new paragraph, he said, because of the divine nature, for this very reason, He said, you ought to give all diligence. He's not talking about being an overcomer or moral because you have a, you've made a hard, strong human effort. He's saying, you got to bear fruit as you participate in the divine nature that was put into you. And he said, you've got to make every effort. That's what giving all diligence means. You've got to apply yourself. You've got to bring you've got to bring it alongside of you. Let me tell you, it takes every bit of diligence and effort as a Christian along with the enabling power of the Holy Ghost to escape the corruption that's in this world caused by evil desire. I thank God that we have the power of Jesus. And frankly, that's something that makes the apostolics different than other Christian movements because we can give to them a power to overcome what they're facing. But while you're feeling Jesus and rejoicing about his power, I'm going to challenge you that we better not fall short of diligently applying ourselves to the word of God and to prayer. 
We should be diligent cultivating what Peter offers in verse 5 through 7 as seven qualities. And if we will do them, we are participating fully in his nature. Look what he says in verse 5. For this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith. You put up verse 5, please. Thank you. Add to your faith. Notice that faith is the root or foundation of the Christian life. The Message Bible says complementing your basic faith with. We're going to look at seven characteristics, but it all starts with faith. All right? Faith in Jesus Christ is what separates Christians from all other people. When we trust Jesus as our Savior, when we're born again into the family of God, that's the foundation of all other qualities in the Christian life. You don't need to let your faith stumble. It is the foundation of your relationship with Jesus. Because there's sometimes I don't have answers, but I have faith. In fact, when answers aren't enough, my faith in Jesus is enough. Amen. And he says, add. Everybody say add. You see that in in verse 5? Now that word add means to develop or to exercise. In fact, I I believe I have it in your notes there, but uh, in ancient Greece, um, the state would establish a chorus, but the director paid for the expenses for training the chorus. So that word choreograph. Uh, that word chorus. The implication is a partnership. The director was in participation with the state. It was a mutual investment. And finally, the word come to understand that he provides for or supports or supplies in abundance. The believer is to furnish or to supply or to support his life to these seven godly qualities. So let's look at them. Let's look at them. Let me give you just the overview of all of them. Verse 5. Add to your faith virtue, that's number one, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, number three, is self-control, and to self-control, number four, is perseverance, and number five is godliness, and number six is brotherly kindness, and then number seven is love. Now, before we get into those, I want to make some observations about these seven qualities. If you're ready to write, here we go. Number one, they are not automatic. These traits do not come automatically. It's not like you're walking in and you step on the the, uh, mat and the door comes swinging open. All right? They don't appear suddenly without a cause. Human effort is necessary in order to add them to your your life. They require intentionality. But here's the thing. As we assume our responsibility to grow, we find number two is that God empowers us. He enables us while he yet gives us responsibility to learn and grow. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. God's ingredients of divine power and promises mixed with our ingredients of participation and faith leads us to number one and two. It's not automatic, but God does empower us. And here's something important too. Number three, they are not optional. All of these traits that we're going to look at have got to be a continual part of your life and my life. And let me tell you, I'll just say it another way. They're not multiple choice. When you look at these seven traits, mm, I'll take one, three, and seven. No, they're not optional. Number four, we don't finish one and start on the next, but we work on them all together. These characteristics, these traits, are not in isolation from each other. In fact, you can look at the Scriptures, and I'm not going to debate if you feel differently, but I don't even see them as if you'll do this, then you add this, and then you add this. I'm just telling you they're all a part of what God is doing in our life. They're integrated into the others to establish this well-rounded spiritual maturity. In fact, uh, verse 7 in the message says, each dimension fitting into and developing the other. That's what we mean by add or develop or exercise. Ingredients do not replace one another. They are mixed together. Now, let me say something before we dive into these. 
We shouldn't be surprised or resentful of the process. Of us growing and learning, we should not resent or even be surprised that there's a process in all of this. Years ago, I read a story of this little girl that returned from her first day at school. And the parent asked, did you learn anything? And that little girl said, well, I guess not. Said, I've got to go back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And as interesting as that statement is, there's a lot of truth in that because growing and learning comes little at a time over a lifetime. Heard somebody else say one time, when people say, how are you doing? He said, I stopped saying, great, fantastic. He said, I just said, growing and learning. Because he said, I found out there's more growing and learning days than there are necessarily great and fantastic days. But what I'm trying to tell you is that it takes time, and the important thing is to keep coming back. The next day, and the next day, and the next day. The next chapter, the next verse, all of these things together. What God is doing through you, it doesn't stop with the day that you're in. In fact, this day what he's doing is a fulfillment of what he promised in previous days. we got to keep coming back or it cannot happen. That's why every worship gathering is important. you got to keep coming back. That's why every daily devotion of prayer and scripture is significant. You got to keep coming back. That's why a personal Bible study is important. That's why community groups on Thursday night are important. That's why discipleship things like we had with Discovery is important. That's why Purpose Institute is important because we got to keep coming back and back. And by the way, I thank the Lord that we have 12 students this semester in uh, Purpose Institute and 27 others that signed up for the Friday night class. You know what they're doing? They keep coming back. Jesus is teaching us again and again and again. And we've got to get a hunger and desire that I can't get enough. Amen. Amen. Don't out yourself. When somebody offers a Bible study or some kind of something, you say, oh, I've already done that. Well, we can always learn something. Amen? All right, we're we're trying to get to these seven attributes. So let's look at it. On your paper there, you have seven of them on that back page. Number one, as we mentioned, is virtue to each Faith, a believer should add or develop virtue. Uh, The New International Version says goodness. There's other translations that says moral excellence. I'm trying to define this so that you truly understand what Peter is saying. So there is, he said, add to your faith morals. You know what morals are? Morals are knowing the difference between right and wrong and doing it. Hello, tongue talkers. You ought to be moral. In Peter's lifetime, and it hasn't changed today, the dominant culture of the day was and is moral corruption. It's a part of the unbridled human nature. You see immorality all around you. You see corruption. Name it. In in government, in leadership. You see it in in, in, uh, unbridled sex and unbiblical sex and power and money. You know what Peter said? As people of God, as participators of the divine nature, we've got to develop or add virtue, goodness. He's talking about morality. And only the empowerment of the Holy Spirit can successfully protect us from the path of moral decline. We've got to have the Holy Ghost. But we've got to choose as well the path of morality. You know God's not going to force his redeemed people to live morally. You understand that you can yield to the Holy Spirit and pray in an unknown tongue and leave this room and be immoral in some way, somehow, some fashion. Speaking in an unknown tongue simply says, I'm, and I'm not, we need it. Paul said, I'm glad I speak the tongues more than you all. But here's the thing. It is not a test of discipleship. It is a test of yielding to the Holy Spirit. But you've got to understand our human will and discipline has got to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, I want to show you this. I, I love to look at original uh, words and, and compare them in other passages in the Bible. So you, you see, number one, this virtue, this number one, goodness, morality, excellence. That is the same Greek word that he uses in verse 3 of this same chapter. When he says, his divine power has given to us all things through him who called us by glory and See it? Virtue. Morality. Okay? But here's another one that's the same Greek word. Peter uses it in his first book, 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says in verse 9, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Anybody know the verse? That you should show forth or proclaim the what? The what? Praises. That's the word for goodness, moral excellence, virtue. That you should show forth the, the, the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know, I've done it. You, you got it. We use that scripture for, for, so we know we can dance and shout hallelujah. Do you know you can proclaim him, praise him by way of your virtue, your goodness, your moral excellence? Hey, Joseph, when you tell Mrs. Potiphar, I'm not going to sin against your husband and God, you just gave glory to God. Amen. That's good teaching. Teach on. I can preach, be my own amen corner. I'm an all-service pastor here. Praise God. All right, number two. He said, add to that, develop knowledge. Now, this word knowledge here is not intellectual pursuits. It is a spiritual knowledge that comes through the Holy Spirit. And you must intentionally educate yourself into the mindset of the kingdom. You ever heard somebody say, well, they are kingdom-minded? Okay. Well, it's talking about they mind the things of the Spirit. How do you, in fact, Jesus told Peter in his earlier days of being a disciple, he said, you don't mind the concerns of God, just human concerns. And so he had to learn to get kingdom-minded and educated of what the kingdom was all about. How do you educate yourself? How do you get the knowledge that he's talking about? you got to read your Bible, pray every day. That was a rap of the song I used to sing as a kid. You know another thing? Is you got to be with one another. I have been in small groups where I have seen people participating in that small group, and they are learning and adding knowledge in their relationship with Jesus Christ that they would not have got from the Bible alone or prayer alone. We do not need to miss the one another that helps us to add knowledge and helps us to add these qualities into our Christian walk. You cannot do it alone. And if you're not participating in Thursday night group, you are robbing yourself of knowledge. Well, I'll just pray and read my Bible in my ivory tower and I don't, nobody gets on my nerves. You are robbing yourself. There is something that the body of Christ can do that nothing else can do. Thank you, Sister Shay. I felt that. And God's doing great things. She's got folks coming that, that are not believers or at least not apostolics. Her group is growing, praise God, and, and I thank the Lord for that. If you say amen, I might think of something to say about you too. Praise God. All right, here we go. Knowledge. And by the way, this knowledge is not following some legalistic code of head knowledge. But we're increasing in Bible knowledge. We are doing our best. We are making um, very intentional steps. Uh, my wife and Brother Sean are working, and Sister Shalon, they're working on this knowledge project and working through the small groups that we are trying to be intentional to get into you things that will help you grow. We're doing all we can, but you got to show up. you got to participate. I'm not saying you're not, but you are now for sure, all right? So what do we got here? Faith, goodness. Virtue, whatever you want to call it. Spiritual knowledge, they're not enough. Let's look at number three. You've got to also make an effort to practice self-control. You know what self-control means? It means to have your passions under control. That's a whole 
big difference between the anarchy of lack of control of the false teachers. If you read 2 Peter chapter 2, he talks about these false teachers. They were saying that self-control was not needed because deeds don't save you anyway. So just live as you want to live. Well, I know my deeds do not save me, but I also know my deeds are a reflection or fruit of my faith. And we're saved so we can grow and resemble Jesus Christ. God wants to produce character in us. Amen? He wants to do that. But that requires discipline. That requires effort. And as we obey Jesus, and he guides us by his spirit, we will develop self-control. So so I can't just, I'm sorry, I, I just, I can't help it. I can't help it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If I had this phone in my ear, if I was going to pick up this phone, and you had a gun and said stop, trust me, I'm going to stop. We can do it through the help of Jesus and through self-control. Look at number four. Believers living in these last days He said, you're surrounded with scoffers and false teachers. So what you need is perseverance. That word perseverance means staying under. In the New Testament, it's frequently used for this steadfastness under adversity. That when adversity comes, I persevere. I will not give in and I will not give up. You know what Proverbs 27.10 says? At least I hope that's what that one says. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That's not condemning you. That's just a self-test that says when adversity comes, and if I stumble or fall, that means that I need to get stronger. That means I need to grow. And let me tell you, patience has the power to stabilize and anchor our redemptive relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been saved, you want to stay saved, then I'm telling you, you need to add perseverance. Because without patience, it threatens our lives. It threatens us physically, it threatens us spiritually. We need perseverance. And God help us in this generation When one thing doesn't go our way, when there's one thing that would happen that we weren't expecting, we're ready to give in or not show up or turn in the towel. Let me tell you, we need to add to our faith some perseverance that says, I'm going to stand strong in the midst of adversity. And whatever adversity we're facing now, I'm not minimizing, but let me tell you, it could be very much just poquito in comparison to what may come as these days grow worse and worse. We need to grow up. I'm not being insensitive to the adversity. My heart goes out when you and I face adversity. But you know what? The way I figured, I'm going to have adversity with or without Jesus, so I'll take it with Jesus. Amen. Number five. Everybody say godliness. What is godliness? It is piety. Another word you might want to say is reverence toward God. Godliness is an attitude, hear me, of nearness to the holiness of God. When we, in, when we are practicing godliness, we have an awe. We have a godly fear We have a respect and a reverence for him. What does James 4, 8 say? It says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And so as that distance between God and us narrows, we can reach that place of awe and respect and reverence. You know, Isaiah testified that he saw the glory of God fill the temple. And his response as that gap was closed between him and Jesus more than him and the Lord God before, more than ever before, he said, woe is me. There was this piety. There was this godliness that says, I'm undone. I'm unclean. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I pray that God would help us in our relationship with him to add this reverence to God. 
the, the, the reverence of the things of God. I think, and, and I'm, I get it, I'm all for respecting property. I'm all for respecting this house of God. You know, we nor our children need to run around and abuse this. I couldn't say that enough. We need to be respectful. But let me tell you, there's a lot of people that are more respectful to relics and representations of God than they are of God. So I didn't say, pour your juice on that purple chair right now. But I did say that in our relationship with Jesus, are we seeking a godliness, aware of him and his holiness? Praise God. Number six, he says, develop brotherly kindness. And this is translated in the Greek as a practical caring for others. So I think you could put the word care in there. The Greek word comes from Philadelphia that means brotherly kindness. All right? And I can give you some examples in other places of Scripture that talks about brotherly kindness, caring for one another. Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another. With what? With brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. That's why the writer of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 said, let brotherly love continue. They were teaching that in the body of Christ, we need to be affectionate towards one another in brotherly love. We need to give preference to one another. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Don't just continue in brotherly love, but increase in brotherly love. Yeah, I care for my brother. He said increase in that. Yes, I have love one for another. Increase in that. That's what he's saying. You understand that? That we're actually caring about somebody. That it matters to us what one another is going through. That's a part of our faith. That's a part of this no-fail recipe. And then number seven, he said, not just brotherly kindness, a concern for others' needs. He said, but you need to add love. Now, what are we talking about? Paul's not being, excuse me, Peter here is not being redundant with brotherly love and now love. In the Greek language, there were at least three words that conveyed various aspects and kinds of love. Now, that's unlike the English language. Uh, we only have one word for love. It's love. If you want to write that down, I'll, I'll wait. So, in other words, we can express our love for God, for a family member, for a pet, for food, and we just use love for all of it. You know, Oh, I love your spaghetti. I love God. Okay. Spaghetti, God. Okay. We, we don't possibly mean the same thing. But in the Greek language, they had different words that they spoke to, to describe that. And so we've already mentioned brotherly love was Philadelphia. It was brotherly love. It was kindness or caring. All right? There is this Greek word now that Peter uses, this seventh attribute, and it is agape which is a sacrificial love. If you want to find a great example of how they interchange, you go to John 21 and the conversation that Jesus had with Peter. And he said, you know, Peter, do you love me more than these? He would say, do you agape me? Do you love me supremely, sacrificially? And Jesus, uh, Peter said, you know I filio you. You know, you know I'm your friend. On and on it goes. You can look at that, okay? Now, what am I saying? The, he said, as a part of our Christian walk, we don't need to just have concern and kindness. We need to have agape love. That's the kind of love that God exhibits towards sinners. Where God so loved the world that he gave. That God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were sinners. Agape is the highest form of sacrificial love. Now hear me. If Peter is distinguishing between brotherly love, door number six, and agape love, door number seven, 
then that means we should have both. They're not optional. They're not multiple choice. Peter already urged this attitude on readers in the first epistle. In fact, we could look at it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Since you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, he said you ought to love one another fervently with a pure heart. In fact, Jesus himself said, in John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you agape one another, that you sacrificially love one another, as I have sacrificially loved you, that you also will sacrificially love one another. By this will all know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Let's quickly go to 1 John chapter number 4. And this is that love that Peter was talking about. He said, 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, verse 11, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I know it's rhetorical, but how many are glad Jesus Christ loved you enough to sacrifice his life for your redemption? Well, John just said, if God loved us that way, we ought to love one another that way. Drop down to verse 20, same chapter, 1 John 4, drop down to verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, this is developing in my mind. At our leadership summit, I was back there talking to Pastor Young. Uh, even this morning, the Lord's talking to me about some things. And, and I, you know, I'm challenged that do we really love the family of God that we were born into the Spirit like we love our family that we were born bi biologically into? I've been chewing on that. Because, you know, you can say, oh, you know, my family, they're weird. They're dysfunctional. But if I come against them, you have suddenly joined the defense of the dysfunctional club. You know, I mean, it's just true that, that, that we, we can aggravate one another. We can hurt one another. But there's something about family. We're able to forbear. We're able to look over. Am I crazy or is that right? There's just something about family that we were born into and, 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 and what you gave birth to. And what I'm saying here and what, and what the Word of God is saying is that the way God loved us sacrificially, we need to love the family of God. And so what I'm exploring and I'm asking here today is do we love the family of God like we love our human family? I understand there's a difference between the two. But there ought to be a greater increasing love for one another. The level and quality of love is possible. That I'm, you know the, the kind of love I'm talking about right now? It's only possible through the abiding spirit of God. I just want you to know that. So it, you know, well, I can't. Let me tell you. Attaining the kind of love, agape love, sacrificial love, it, it, it has to come from a heart of a believer. It does not come naturally to humans who we are self-centered, self-seeking, self-focused. But let me tell you, in fact, Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God is being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So you say, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know. Like, well, okay, just say you can't. But the Holy Spirit, the divine power, the participation with that will help you to love when you don't have the ability to love within your human self. Does that make sense? I'll tell you an example of that. In the 25 years that we've been here pastoring, Back at Pulaski, I'm telling you, if I ever saw agape love, that there is no way it could have been within the power of that believer. Surely it was when I looked at two sisters. One was a guest. One was a member of this church. And the one sitting next to her that she invited to church was the one that committed adultery with her husband. That ain't natural. That's supernatural. So, are you hearing me today when I say, oh, man, I'm thinking about that. I don't know if I love the family of God like I love my family. Okay, but 
Connect to the divine power that's within you. Start praying for your family of God. Start serving your family of God. Invest in your family of God. You know what? The Holy Ghost in you can do more for you than just make you feel good and say, hubba bubba and give me my miracle. The Holy Ghost can help you to love as you should love. I'm not mad. I thought I'd better smile. Preachers get intense think they're mad. Does that help? Now, those seven characteristics are there. Now look at verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, neither, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So let's look at this. Verse number 8. Here's what happens. Here's the results if you do these seven things by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and your determination. It says, now, in the, in the original translation, you see there in verse number 8, let me see with you. It says, for if these things are yours, that word if is not really there in the original language. And you can see this expressed in other translations. And, and what it's saying is, these qualities are yours. It's not if in the terms that we think of, if, then this is what will happen, a put and take. It's saying these qualities are active, and you've got to grow them in your life. In other words, when you receive the Holy Spirit, there are some things put in you that you've got to make sure they abound. You've got to make sure they increase in measure because they're in there, and if they grow, you will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what happens if you don't do these things. If you lack these things, verse 9, you're short-sighted even to blindness. The King James says, cannot see afar off. And it's indicating the person is blind, not because he's literally blind, but because he is willfully shutting his eyes. As if the same thing, when you don't want to hear something. La, 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 la. This is someone here that is blinding his own eyes, covering it up. It says he has forgotten. That means he deliberately chose to forget. That he was cleansed from his old sins. What are old sins? It's talking about sins that you committed prior to the new birth, to water baptism. He says if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. But I love verse 10 where we started from. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent or eager to make your call and election sure. When you see the word calling there, it's referring to the work of salvation. It's talking about that invitation that Jesus gives, that call he gives. When Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. That call is not for a select few. That call is for everyone. He has called and elected, called and chosen. That simply means he invited you, and when you responded, you were chosen as a part of based on his mercy and your hunger and desire. He said, when you were saved, that calling, praise God, make it sure your actions or your lack of actions will affect your calling. Be sure, the Amplified says, that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. Virtue and holiness are an evidence of salvation. And that Greek word for sure, in the classical Greek, you know what it means? It means a warranty deed, like someone has today on a house or another piece of property. He said, you can be sure. There's a warranty. You can be guaranteed. He said, if you will make your calling and election sure, if you do these things, you will not fail or stumble. You will not trip up. You will not experience a reversal because if you're maturing in Jesus Christ, you will not trip up in your spiritual life. 
I'm telling you that the no-fail recipe is that if you will rely on the divine power and the Holy Spirit of God, coupled with your determination and adding these virtues that he is talking about in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, there is no way that you will fail or stumble. And really, the believer here has no viable option but to apply himself or herself to these issues of spiritual growth. And if we fail to do it, it's a symptom of spiritual regression. In other words, the only alternative to spiritual progress is to stumble and to fall. There's no such thing as static spirituality. Well, you know, I'm just kind of holding my own. No, you're, you're either gaining or losing in your growth in the relationship with Jesus Christ. But if I'll add those things, when I say, I, that doesn't mean that I'm perfect. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to make mistakes. Of course that I am. But the point is that I am going to stay on the course. If I fall, I'm going to get up again. I'm not going to walk out. I'm not going to leave because I put perseverance. I added it to my faith. And look what he says. I love this in verse number 11. He says, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, the streets are paved and wide open for an eternal kingdom. You know what I'm preaching here tonight? I'm not preaching eternal security, at least not unconditional, but I am preaching conditional eternal security. I do believe in conditional eternal security. I believe that if we obey the Word of God and the conditions of the Word of God, I will not fail. I will make it because of the grace of God, the empowerment of the Holy, Holy Spirit, and my made-up mind. I don't know where we are. I don't know who I'm talking to. But let me tell you, we need to mature past that point that every time something happens and your best, your best most spiritual friend doesn't answer the telephone, that you think the rapture took place. That may be a silly way of saying it, but you know what? I have confidence in the salvation that Jesus has placed in my life, and I don't have to live in fear. In fact, I'll tell you, let's go to Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, verse 20, that talks about this. I believe it lays out this conditional eternal security. It says in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up. Somebody shout, that's me. That's something I've got to do. I've got to build myself up. And if you're slack in, in, in worship gatherings and community groups, you're not building yourself up. If you're slack on prayer and Bible reading, you're not building yourself up. Oh, I'm facing, I'm just feeling so weak. Well, then when's the last time you fed yourself spiritually? This is not rocket science. I want to get closer with Jesus. Then you've got to build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And I, I've been plenty real with you through the years of teaching. That doesn't mean if I miss my, my Bible reading on that day that suddenly I am doomed for hell. But I'm telling you, there's always got to be a course correction. There's always got to be a sensitivity to, the, to God and say, these are the things i got to do. i got to build myself. i got to pray. i got to keep myself. But then I love what says in verse 24. If I'll do those things, look at verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling or falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You know what? I'm going to make it. I said I'm going to make it. You know why? Because I'm trusting in him that is able to keep me from stumbling. And he will present me faultless before that day. How's he going to do it? Because I'm standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I've been clothed with his righteousness. I'm walking and trying to keep step in the spirit. And that is a no-fail recipe. Amen. There was a song that we used to sing as a teenager. I'm not sure that I really cared about the tune that much. But uh, it came back to me while I was studying all this. And it just says, oh, I know that I will make it. For Jesus put it in my will to reach the new Jerusalem. 
Satan doesn't like it and tries to hinder my climb, but I see the lights of the city, and it's just a matter of time. What's that song trying to do? It's trying to infuse in you. I know I'm going to make it. I know I'm going to make it because I've got the divine power and I've got the divine promises. And I have added to that the ingredients and these traits. I'm working on it. I'm growing in him. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. I'm growing. I'm going to make it. And Peter said, I'm about to die. But if you'll do these things, he said, you will never fall or stumble. Oh, surely there's a stumble along the way. But we're talking about that ultimate eternal reward that he talked about in verse 11. We need a confidence in the word of God if we will add to that our own determination and discipline. Amen. 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 Now, if you go to 2 Peter, as I close this out, chapter number 3, these are the last two verses of his letter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. And I'm going to go ahead and read it in the NIV just to make it a little more succinct. He's wrapping this up, just like I am. Here's what he says. Therefore, he's written for three chapters. Dear friends, Since you have been forewarned, now right there, you could insert chapter number three when he's talking about the coming day of the Lord. This is really cool. He summarizes the whole book in just this one verse. He said, you have been forewarned. Just look up. You can study this on your own. Look at chapter three when he's talking about the day of the Lord that's coming. He said, since you've been forewarned, be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. That's chapter 2 of this book where he says there's going to be false teachers and scoffers that's going to rise. So he says, I've warned you about the coming day of the Lord. Now you need to be on guard that you're not carried away by error of the lawless, those false teachers I've talked about in chapter 2, although he didn't know it was chapter 2, and fall from your secure position. That's chapter 1 that we just looked at. Salvation, growing in faith. And as I preached a few weeks or months ago, whatever it was, about all Scripture, you read the the rest of, um, excuse me, that was 2 Timothy that I referenced that. Sorry about that. But I went to all, I did read from 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter about it's all inspiration. I'm trying to be conscientious and you all don't even care. All right, praise God. He said, being led, he said, be steadfast. Don't be led away with the error of the wicked. I'm telling you, we need to be mindful of the deception of the age because you can have 95% truth and 5% lies, and that's deception. He said, I've warned you. I've told you. And then he says in verse 18, the very last verse, he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. The grace saved you. But now, he said, the grace is what's going to keep you if you'll keep growing in that grace. Praise God. Father, I pray that you'd help us not just to be a hearer of the word, but you'd help us to be a doer. And in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would help us here today, all that are listening, that they would hear more than just with a natural ear, but we would hear with our spiritual ear. And I pray, Lord, maybe in their own meditation, their time, they may look at this and say, Lord, where do I find myself in some of these attributes needing to be more intentional and to pray and to find your empowerment? Help me, Lord. Do I need to work on the morality, that virtue, that goodness part? Have I... Have I just because I felt your presence or responded to you in some supernatural way, I use that as a gauge of my right standing with you. Lord, help me to add knowledge, spiritual knowledge, to know the things of God and not be carnally minded when we're inundated with all of the systems of this world. Maybe somebody else says, Lord, I need to work on self-control. I need your help with that. I need to talk about it with my friends. I I need that. Lord, I need perseverance. Adversity just overcomes me too quickly. I've got to have your help in that. Or, or Lord, maybe godliness. 
that, Lord, I've got, to, I've got to walk in your holiness and have a respect for you and a piety. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too casual, not fearful of you. I have a relationship with you, but respect of who you are and attain to your holiness. Maybe brotherly kindness, Lord, that I need to be more caring for my brother and sister. And surely, Lord, you intend for that to grow into a sacrificial love. How you love me, I want to love those that you saved just like me. In the name of Jesus, I pray I need your strength, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Praise God.